you know, when, when you see patients in clinic, uh, the goal is to uh, make a diagnosis ultimately that would treat the appropriate treatment. So, you know, when patients come to see you in clinic, they have in mind that, you know, you're going to make every effort to make a diagnosis and the correct diagnosis. Now, if you don't make it from the first encounter, that's okay. If you need further imaging, further workup to make that diagnosis, that's fine. And what are the four pillars in, to making a diagnosis? Um, you know, in, in neurosurgery, in neurology, uh, it's, uh, it's four things. It's the history, uh, the neurological examination, and then uh, which, which would lead you to localize the lesion. You know, neurosciences, neurosurgery, neurology is about localizing the lesion. You know, you do that with uh, history and neurological examination. For instance, you have someone come in with upper and lower extremity weakness, the lesion is most likely in the cervical spine. If you add to that a cr cranial nerve deficit, you move up a little bit and be in the brainstem. So the first two pillars, history and neurological examination, would lead you to order the appropriate imaging uh, in order to confirm uh, that what you're looking for is truly in the, in the, in the area that, you know, that you're looking for it. And then the imaging would generate a differential diagnosis or a diagnosis. Now, electrodiagnostics as, as a fourth pillar is important, uh, probably more in spine than other uh, domains of neurosurgery. You know, we, we get them, for instance, if you have a patient with a, a cervical radiculopathy and uh, also symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome, you know, both um, involving uh, uh, kind of a C6 distribution, you want to differentiate if it's a, a radiculopathy versus a carpal tunnel, you get an EMG, and this would tell you if you're not sure where, uh, uh, you know, what the diagnosis is. So, you know, diagnostics imaging includes x-rays, CT, and MRIs. That covers most of uh, what we look for and what we look at um, in terms of imaging. Uh, but in order to understand what's abnormal, we need to understand what, what, norm, what normal is, how normal looks like. Even when you operate on a patient, for instance, and you are doing a redo surgery or a redo discectomy, you go to the normal and you identify normal structures before you go into the abnormal. And this way, you avoid complications, you avoid, you know, unnecessary um, uh, extended uh, periods of time operating by, by knowing the normal and by going and looking for it. So before you understand what abnormal pathology is, you need to understand what normal pathology is. And for instance, this is a, uh, what we call a scoliosis x-ray, a 36 inch x-ray, a lateral view, looking at the whole spine and how the head and neck uh, relates to the uh, base of the spine and the, the foundations, the pelvis, cervical lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis, you have seven cervical vertebrae, thoracic, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar, and then the sacrum. And then, you know, the head should be above the pelvis normally. <coughs> And that's a normal appearing, um, close to normal appearing uh, an x-ray. Uh, we're zooming in here, looking at the cervical spine. This is a lateral extra of the cervical spine. And, uh, you know, you got to uh, appreciate that the upper cervical spine, which is composed of the bottom of the skull, C1 and C2, looks differently than the subaxial, subaxial. This is the axis. That's the subaxial cervical spine, which looks you know, similar, uh, similarly um, when compared to the upper cervical spine. And this is a normal appearing x-ray. And what we look for on x-ray, uh, we look for multiple things, but mostly alignment. We, you can see these are the lines that uh, we look for. There's the prevertebral line, anterior cortical line at the level of the ALL, posterior cortical line at the level of the posterior longitudinal ligament, PLL, and then this is an important line, spinal laminar line. So if you have a subluxation or a dislocation, these, this line won't line up all the way through. If there's a subluxation, say, at C5-6, the spinal laminar line would be uh, off anteriorly compared to the uh, rest of the um, uh, spine. So, you know, by and large, you know, this is not a neuroradiology uh, didactic session, but I just want to make you aware that you got to understand the normal, you got to read about it and think about it. This is a CAT scan. Look at this is a CAT scan, looks at bone mainly, and that's a normal bearing CAT scan. You can see the patient has good cervical lordosis. The disc heights in between the vertebrae, these are the discs that are intact. Uh, disc height is uh, preserved. 
compared to this right-sided x-ray where it's total abnormal, which we see here, this is a patient with breast cancer who came in with upper neck pain. You see that she has diffuse metastasis, uh, osteolytic metastasis, osteolytic metastasis, and she has a pathological fracture of C2, causing a C1, C2 subluxation. See the spinal laminar line, see the spinal laminar line here, looks smooth, but it's off here, so because of the subluxation, because of the ventral uh, uh, um, uh, dislocation of C1 compared to C2. So the spinal laminar line does not line up appropriately. So we need to know the normal before we, under, before we recognize the abnormal. And the, and, um, I think uh, my previous colleague alluded to, you know, showed you some imaging and, and, uh, and sequences. These are MR sequences, different sequences uh, throughout the spine. That's a sagittal T2. CSF is hyper intense. So dense for a CT, intense for an MR, hyper intense. And that's a, a T2 weighted sagittal uh, MR of the lumbar spine. This is a T1 where you see CSF hypo intense, dark. This is a T1 image, and we, uh, you know, different sequences would give us different information. That's an axial image uh, of the level of the lumbar spine, and this is a stir image, a T2 stir image, which we use to look for ligamentous disruption. This is best for uh, trauma protocols in terms of um, identifying uh, signal hyper attenuation in, in cases of ligamentous disruption, especially in, in trauma cases. So you have the these are not all the sequences, you know, there's a GRE sequence, there's the DWI and uh, so forth, but these are probably the most important ones that we look for, that we look at um, uh, when we're addressing and evaluating spinal pathology. So understanding anatomy, when you understand the anatomy of something, you understand the function of it. So you understand the anatomy, understand function. How do we understand anatomy and memorize it is by looking, definitely reading books. You got to read um, books, but you also want to uh, make use of these uh, uh, saw bonds and uh, where you can hold it and you look at the anatomy three-dimensional in 3D. You know, when you look at the book, it's 2D, but sometimes a better understanding of anatomy is when you hold and you look at that saw bone for hours and hours understanding what's anterior to what's, what's lateral to what, and uh, you think about it and you go back to the book and, and so forth, and that's how you understand, um, you know, anatomy. More so, or moreover, if there's an opportunity to uh, do some cadaver work, uh, either at your home institutions or if you, uh, there, there are like courses uh, across the United States, you can definitely capitalize on these opportunities. Cadaver labs are important. You would, you know, look at the anatomy uh, in three dimension, in 3D. Uh, you can, you know, uh, dissect, uh, uh, go anterior, posterior, lateral to understand how the neurovascular structures are related to each other. So, and then definitely the fourth uh, uh, weight on, or um, uh, pillar in, in terms of understanding anatomy is that it's doing cases and um, paying attention to uh, uh, cases while you're in, scrubbed in, helping out, assisting, or doing the case itself. So you start with reading books, obviously, and rehearsing and thinking about it look at the anatomy 3D, and then definitely to supplement that is, you know, do it real life uh, on a cadaver and then uh, uh, on patients, uh, you know, when you're scrubbing in, paying attention uh, to, to the um, anatomic structures, anatomic variations. You know, the cadaver lab is a, is a good thing. You can spend hours and hours uh, understanding uh, the anatomy of structures and how they relate to, uh, you know, different layers. Uh, and especially when you want to apply a new technique, you never apply a new technique on a patient. You definitely do it about 10 times on a cadaver and master it on a cadaver before you, uh, you apply it uh, in real life on, on, on a patient. And this way you mitigate uh, any uh, misadventures in terms of complications um, and adverse events. So understanding anatomy is super important. You know, orient yourselves. Uh, and uh, this would enable you also to understand uh, uh, radiology, uh, radiographic uh, imaging. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available 
for medical students across the world.